Howdy folks, I'm Buffalo Bill Cody, also known as the Man of the West. My contribution towards creating a vision that settlement of the plains was the conquest of the West. I lived during America's greatest expansion, 1846 to 1917. I was known as a frontiersman, a buffalo hunter, scout, actor, showman, and Indian fighter. I became famous through dime novels, which greatly exaggerated and fictionalized my adventures. I cemented my fame, but not my legacy, through my Wild West show performed before 50 million people over a 30-year run, becoming America's first international celebrity. The damage to my legacy that's most upsetting are claims that I was a frontman created by publicists and that I was not a leader of my show, nor the people who worked for me. That I took advantage and had no empathy for members of my cast as they performed and traveled in my show. I returned to defend my legacy. I'm discussing critical events and people from childhood on by episode that made me a successful leader. This episode is dedicated to discussions of my years as a scout for the U.S. Cavalry from 1868 to 1878. They were formative and provided the events which formed the basis for acts I chose to reenact in my show. I served as a scout and a dispatch writer during the last of the Indian Wars which began in 1868 and ended in 1898. To understand the challenges that I faced in leading my show, it's essential to understand the background of my performers because many came to my show traumatized and vulnerable. This segment is devoted to experience and traumas suffered by Indian members of my cast. I focus on the Sioux, who became the longest and largest and most popular and important ethnic opponent of my show, and whose way of life changed forever. The Indian performers called show Indians had to portray themselves as villains. They did so, even playing members of the other tribes. So what was the background and environment for the Northern Plains Indians in the second half of the 1800s? They grew up, lived, and either survived or died in a drastically changing environment. Their nomadic way of life was disappearing. Change that accelerated with the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. As a result, travel from coast to coast was reduced to a week. The railroad facilitated the movement of people and goods. The line and later the tributaries of the railroad ran through Sioux hunting grounds. The slaughter of buffalo for their meat, their hides, and later senseless slaughter, shooting them from trains, decimated the herds. I hunted buffalo to feed the workers, not for sport. The Homestead Act passed in 1862 gave 160 acres of public land to those who staked out a claim and improved the land for a fixed period of time. New arrivals flocked to stake claims on public lands, which included Indian lands. Indians were not permitted to stake claims. As a result, beginning in 1851, Indians were being forced off their tribal lands into reservations establishing Indian agencies. The corruption in the agencies became a national embarrassment. The Civil War interrupted settler migration. Indians were able to resume their nomadic existence and hunt buffalo. With the Civil War ending, migration into the plains accelerated. Washington's attention refocused on the plains. Ulysses S. Grant was president. General William Tecumseh Sherman became regional commander of the Missouri. That included the Plains. Following closely in rank and assignment to the Plains, and then replacing Sherman as regional commander was General Sheridan. Sherman took the top post in the military. All three were cut from the same cloth in the Civil War. 
This threesome were convinced and would, if necessary, employ total warfare focused on not only defeating Indian forces, but destroying their sources of supply and support. As violence on the plains increased, demands for federal government action escalated. Use of the army to subdue the Indians was considered. However, the reduction in military strength in the immediate post-Civil War era made the use of force questionable. The great distances and extreme variations of climate and geography increased manpower requirements, introduced logistical and communication problems, and created difficulties of movement. To be sure, the mounted tribes of the plains were a different breed from the Indians the Army had fought in the forest areas of the East. Grant and Sherman understood that the military had to adjust from large-scale battles to counterinsurgency against Indians. The Army would be fighting guerrilla fighters, excellent on horseback, fierce warriors, masters of the plains, spear, bow, and arrow being replaced by guns. The Army had fought Indians in the West in the period after the Mexican War but much of the direct experience of its officers and men had been lost during the Civil War. Many of the officers who would be moved to the forefront of the Army would have limited or no frontier and Indian experience. Cavalry regiments and scout companies needed to be formed, trained, and deployed. About 30% of the newly organized regiments would be manned by immigrants, many Irish. Forts had to be built in remote, unsupported areas. They would be difficult to defend, especially along the Bozeman Trail heading west across Sioux hunting grounds. Additionally, reconstruction of the South limited funding for campaigns on the plains. To buy time, a decision was made to pursue assimilation of Indians, which meant forcing Indians to accept Western culture through education, to become citizens, to undertake peaceful farming on reservations. In exchange for moving onto reservations, the U.S. would guarantee the lands of the reservation would remain the tribes forever. In addition, the U.S. government offered guarantees to stop encroachment by settlers and miners and other Indian tribes. The means by which this would be accomplished, treaties, nothing new. The U.S. government signed 370 treaties with numerous indigenous nations from 1778 to 1871. A peace commission was established in 1868. General Sherman was on the commission. This led to the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868. The United States recognized the Black Hills to be part of the Great Sioux Reservation, set aside for their exclusive use for perpetuity, that is, forever. Didn't work? Treaty failed. Why? The Fort Laramie Treaty, like many others, was modified three times. Once when gold was discovered in the Black Hills in 1874 by none other than General Custer of Little Bighorn Notoriety. A battle with the Sioux resulting in the largest single loss of personnel by military in the Indian Wars. Tribes were loosely knit societies of individualists living a nomadic existence under leaders whose control and influence fluctuated with the tribe's fortunes. The language in the treaty was complex and not fully understood by the Indian chiefs signing the treaty. In some cases, chiefs were selected to be treaty signatories, leaving powerful chiefs out of the negotiations. Frequently, some Members of the tribe, particularly young warriors, refused to accept the terms. Where there was disagreement, tribes fragmented into bands led by sub-chiefs supporting or violating the treaty. In addition, many treaties required tribes not to fight each other, yet they did, made worse by the fact that boundaries between tribes put them in proximity for each other. At times, the tribes were commingled on those same reservations. Another major reason was the way treaties were negotiated, reviewed, and executed. Indian tribes were asked, more often coerced, 
into approving treaties at the councils with U.S. negotiators before treaty approvals by the Senate, funding by the House, and ratification with the signature of the President. Further, many treaties promised goods, often provisions, money annuities, requiring approval of funding by the House. If funding was delayed, tribes did not receive promised assistance. As a result, struggling Indians experienced malnutrition and starvation. Health care provided was poor, and tribes suffered from diseases brought by the settlers. Because of the delays or failure to deliver promised support, tribes became disenchanted with the U.S. treaty process and refused to move or stay on the reservations. Force was used to return the bands to the reservations. Violence followed. On the U.S. side, the authority of negotiating officials was unquestioned. But the power to enforce treaty provisions on highly independent settlers and miners proved inadequate. Breach after breach provoked the Indians to action. Settlers, trained surveyors, small groups, and even army units and posts in the close to reservations fell victim to disaffected Indians. Invariably, the army was called in to protect the offending citizens and punish the Indians. Eventually, the U.S. ended the treaty system altogether, and Indians became wards of the government. The bottom line, pursuit of manifest destiny and policies which stereotyped Indians as people of nature, that is, savages standing in the way of progress, made their ultimate fate inevitable. I lived through all of this and gained an understanding of the injustices Indians had suffered and their reactions to them. I likewise understood the depredations suffered by the migrants, settlers, and railroad workers. I undertook and it was to become my role as scout to support the Army's objectives. I did not hunt buffalo for pure sport or to support an unwritten but widely applied policy of exterminating the buffalo herds. I hunted buffalo to feed the railroad workers and cavalry. I must admit, however, I did agree to act as a hunter and guide for the buffalo hunts that had sponsors, including the Army. I hosted an archduke from Russia and other dignitaries on buffalo hunts. These hunts created headlines and reached the public and fanned the ugly practice of hunting buffalo by shooting them from trains. Although I was engaged in 14 violent encounters with Indians, my primary work was as a scout and dispatch writer. And although I chose and had reenactments scripted to serve a view of cavalry, settlers, and cowboys as heroes, and Indians as villains in my Wild West show. I not only provided Indians equitable employment, but also had them share their culture with a vast audience. And by the way, some of what they performed in my show was prohibited on the reservations. My Indian employees were often key principals in their tribes. Take Chief City Bull, a renowned Sioux chief who participated in planning Custer's defeat. Another was Chief Black Elk, an Iguala Lokota medicine man who rose to fame during and after his participation in my show. There were many others over the decades. These men gained knowledge about the enormous size and cope of a growing U.S. in comparison to their decreasing numbers. They took back what they learned to their tribes to help formulate survival tactics in a U.S.-dominated environment. So by the time I entered scouting for the Calvary in 1868, Indian tribes and their way of life were unraveling, but they were still strong enough to pose a significant military challenge. In response, the military deployed significant numbers of cavalry to the region. Professionals took the place of volunteers. The need for scouts was great. 
individual frontiersmen. I was one of them. The companies of scouts were contracted to serve in that function. Forts and outposts were built. In addition, Indians friendly to the U.S. were recruited to serve as scouts. The best Indian scouts were Pawnees, whose tribes had been decimated and reduced in size by the arrival of the Sioux and other tribes invading Pawnee territory in the early 1800s. The remaining Pawnees got along with the settlers and U.S. military and were looking for revenge. A company of Pawnee scouts were established and was very effective. I was caught up in the accelerating dynamics and turmoil and folding on the planes. Of course, when I started scouting at age 21, I had no idea that one day I would be recruiting and employing Indians in a Wild West show. I never scouted with a party of soldiers after Indians that I didn't feel a bit ashamed for myself and a whole heap sorrier for them.